selected um, a, a number of them for best projects and nominations. Um, and then we'll do a quick review, and you're also welcome to ask me any questions you might have about the um, exam when we do this review. Um, and then finally, some like closing words and feedback and so on. Um, about office hours, like, we probably won't need the full hour and a half today. Um, so, and I have another faculty meeting at 2, so I would rather, like, if you didn't have any questions, that you just come ask me or meet with me after uh, this, but I also I can like do half an hour between three and three thirty. So if you need any of those, uh, if you like find any of those times to reach me instead of two p.m., that would be great. Okay, let's get started. Best project. So like, how do we pick best projects? We want to talk a little bit about the process. Um, so the way this works is that like we all like, you submit it on Sunday, um, then all your TAs review your projects, um, and then they pick the four or five of their favorite projects that we will then discuss in like a long meeting, where we look at every single video, we look at every single project, um, and then kind of like explore whether they, this is kind of like a project among the top, let's say, 10, um, so that we will show them today here. How many projects per TA? Uh, four to five. What do you mean? Oh, projects per TA. Uh, yes, four, like each TA, Selects so of their set of 10 projects, it's like four to five for us to review as a group. So we look at about half of all the projects. We had 33 projects this year. We look at about half of them uh, in this meeting, and we do this first cut by essentially the TAs looking at their very best projects. We also look at the very worst, um, but I'm not going to share those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so. From then on out, like basically, if you're on the board, then uh, you you basically get 11 points. Um, and so after this process, each TA gets three votes and distributes these votes amongst their favorite projects. And, and like me, uh, as uh, I also get three votes. And so based on this, we pick uh, the top, like the winner and the, the second and third, and in this case, fourth place. Uh, although I should say that uh, the results this year are. We have one first place and then three runners up. And we don't rank the three runners up, so like the order that I present them here is, is arbitrary. Um, and those four projects, all of them get 120% of the points. So if you were in this group of four, uh, then you actually have 12 points already on your uh, on your project. Then we have seven honorable mentions, those get 110% of the points. Um, again, uh, th there is no ranked order in here, I'm just presenting them uh, in random order. And all of those will be listed in the Hall of Fame on the website uh, with links to them. 
Okay, any questions about the process? Great, so let's get started. Um, the honorable mentions are set in no particular order, and I'm going to essentially just say this project, say the names. I'm sorry if I mangle your uh, the pronunciation of your name, and then I'll play the video. So, one of the uh, honorable mentions earthquake damage visualization by Vera Shratut, Natalia Soto, and uh, Reza Shivani. Congrats. So this is a visualization by Reza, Natalia, and Viraj. If we click on Explore, we can go right into our earthquake visualization where we have a sunburst and a scatter plot and a map. Um, and this map right here was used or was created using Leaflet, which is which is a plugin for JavaScript. Um, and you can filter it by area, stories, year builds, repair costs, uh, and that will change the the kind of data that's displayed, as you can see. And then you can filter the buildings that are shown. Uh, as you can see, these are all number of buildings in that region. Um, and if I hover over it, you can see the region that's being hovered. And I can filter all of the buildings on this map with my sunburst right here. And as you can see, there's a tooltip describing um, all of the details of all the buildings that were built between 1902 to 1928. And the wedge size is describing the total number, of, total number of buildings right now, and we can change that to repair costs, or to downtime, or to ground acceleration. Then we also have a scatter plot, which we'll load right now. And then if we were to click on one of these dots right here, it'll take you right to the location of that building on the map. And if we change the x-axis or y-axis, that will also reflect on the scatter plot. We have a legend describing the colors um, of each building. So steel is pink and concrete is orange, etc. And also, we can have an overview view of the map, or we can do detailed view as well. And as you just saw right there on the top right, we have the epicenter of the earthquake. We also have a top page, a help page, and a background page. Okay. Great job. You can stand up while we applaud. So. <laughs> Is this group here? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, let's give you another applause. Okay, uh, next honorable mention is Who Removes by Liam Go and Tian Yu Li and uh, Dajian Niti Tandra. Congrats. Are you here? Thank you. 
in the morning time when people finish work. And the last one we talked about is how time work. And especially we see the time when people get up late. Because it's 7 p.m. That is all five. Thank you for the Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next runner up is Utah Transcriptome Surfer by Liebe Witt uh, and Tinner Travis, or and Jack. <laughs> That's probably just a copy and paste error. So I think Liebe Witt and uh, Tinner Travis is, uh, Travis Tinner is right here. Are you going to hear? Uh, okay. <laughs> Welcome to our data visualization. Our data visualization combines a dimensional reduction technique with a heat map and a variety of other tools. This allows us to add context to our dimensional reduction techniques. Here in this data visualization, we show the cell, and we show how the cell is separate from one another based off of the expression of G. Here we see that these pain sensing neurons here in the top right corner are separate from everything else. But we don't have a good idea for why they're separate. So we'll go ahead and do this uh, PCA transformation where we'll center our data. And now when we center our data, we get a much better view of what's going on. These pain sensing neurons are separate up here because of these genes. One of these genes is sodium channel. This is a valid target for us to go after if we want to target and stop chronic pain. But we still have a problem. These neurons aren't very separate from each other. So we'll go ahead and turn to another technique. Here we'll select genes based off of different gene families. Here we have a gene search, so we've already selected about four families. We'll go ahead and add one more. This is an acetylcholine gene. These are all the genes that will be added when I press enter. And now we see we get a new dimensional reduction. We still have this cluster of points down here, so we can simply get rid of them to see how well this data separates. As I click, these neurons go ahead and are removed. And now we see that these cells are very well separate. Sodium channel 9A separates low threshold mechanical sensing cells from everything else. But in addition to this, you can see that there's, that there's genes in here that aren't separating these cells. And that's due to their low expression. Now we can normalize over these genes, and now they play a much bigger role in our dimensional reduction, and we can see them much better. Here we'll go ahead and end on hierarchical clustering. And now you can see how these genes are related to each other and how they define different cell types. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs> so our next runner up is Beast for Your Eyes by John Lund, Lizzie Kamara, and Bob Townsend. <laughs> combines nutrition price and health data as well as original artwork into a tool that helps you do the process. It has two main components, Nutrient Explorer and a Meal Planner. The visualization defaults to showing the Nutrient Explorer. On the left, we have a table showing all the foods we put in our data set, and on the right is a scatter plot with a circle for each of those foods. The table shows price and nutritional content for serving the food. The headers of the nutrient columns also display the recommended daily value based on the personal information provided in the inputs at the top of the page. These values update dynamically. Each of these columns shows a donut chart which shows what percentage of that daily value is filled by one serving of that food. The x and y axis of the scatter plot can be changed to plot the different nutrients in the table. The toggle switch also allows the users to switch between showing nutrients by serving, which is what is shown in the table, and showing nutrients by 100 grams. This allows users to compare the nutrient density of your foods. The scatter plot also features tool tips, synchronized highlighting, and brushing with the table. When the meal planner tab is selected, users can add or remove foods to the menu. The total price and nutritional value of the meal is broken down by the individual contributions of each food. The daily values referenced here are also set dynamically by the controls. 
If the food vendor exceeds 100% daily value for any nutrients, the y-axis will adjust itself to accommodate that. The preset drop-down has a few sample meals that come with information about the relative nutrition of the meal. These can be further tweaked by the user. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> Next runner up is House Divided Can Stand by Michael Young, Thomas Pace, and Fun Fei Lan. Are you here? <laughs> Provided can expand is a visualization tool meant to explore gerrymetric, widespread effectiveness, and the relationship between the two. The tool uses the efficiency gaps to characterize gerrymetry and a metric developed by the Center for Effective Lawmaking to characterize legislative effectiveness. Our visualization tool explores the efficiency gap, legislative effectiveness, and their relationship with the United States House of Representatives between 1976 and 2014. to show the season. Each row represents a team and each column represents the week. You can see who they played in each week. Then we have a parallel coins graph here on the left. <laughs> this corresponds and I can look at, for example, Denver Broncos statistics for the whole season. If I want to look at this one game, I can hover over Hawks and see the Broncos or Seahawks and look at just the Broncos statistics right here. Now, if I come to the parallel coin side, if I want to look at a team that passes a lot or a game where teams pass a lot, we can see that typically if the team passes or has a similar pass attempt, they actually lose more. Now, these are all pretty broad um, details, so if I want to get into a little bit more detail, I can go over and choose a game. So I'm going to choose the Chiefs first Rings. Now, I see brings me down to a field, and this is all the fourth down from this game for both the Rams and the Chiefs. If I click on one, I can narrow it down to just the Chiefs and vice versa. However, we'll keep it all in for now. Now, if I hover over these, it explains a little bit more details. For example, this is a fourth and two in the fourth quarter, and it's the Chiefs possession. Now, if I click here, this shows the similar plays from this line. So they all start from the line. So they have a similar first down line. Now we can see that from this line, people typically punt more and go for it less. However, when they do go for it, they're actually more successful, successful than not. This is pretty interesting, and you can do this for all of these. Now, what if I want to make my own scenario here? I can click up here, and I can choose where I want to be on the field. Then I can choose where I want the first down line to be in relation to where the line scrimmage is. This is cool, and I can kind of make it my own and explore what is usually done in the NFL in 2018. 
That's all. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, next time I will mention is finalists for our wife, Larry Munian and Daniel Malmut. The goal of this project is to visualize the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which catalogs about 4,000 planets that have been discovered outside of our solar system. To begin, the data is shown in parallel coordinates of watch. At the top of each axis, you can select a feature coordinate you want to show in that axis using the drop-down. We also support brushing on the axis, which highlights the two lines built through it. If multiple brushes are drawn, we only had the lines that pass through all of them. Certain categorical labels also have informational tooltips on hover. And if you click on them, it will generate a brush automatically for that particular category. Lastly, we have a toggle at the bottom, which can show and hide incomplete data. That is, grants which are missing one, of the, one or more of the selected data coordinates. The second visualization tool is Scatterplot. And is with the parallel coordinates. You can select the axes with drop downs. You can also draw brushes. And if you happen to have the same axes in the parallel coordinates, these brushes will be in sync. If you move them in one place, they will move in the other. This also gives an opportunity to show our filtering method, which uses the brushes. This simply filters the data down to only contain those elements which were included in the brushes when it's clicked. You can do this repeatedly to get down to a very small size. And you can easily clear those filters to return to the whole data set. Lastly, if you hover over a data point in the scatter plot, you can see the particular values, and if you click on it, if you click on something else, <laughs> if you click on something else, you will be taken to an informational page from NASA with everything you need to know about that particular object. You can even find related publications here. The last visualization is the violence module. As before, you can select the axes using drop downs. The x axis will always be a categorical or discrete option, and the y axis will be continuous. This allows you to easily gauge the distribution of a particular continuous coordinate with categorical. In this case, it is very clear that microlensing, a discovery method, is capable of seeing planets from a much further distance than any other. While you may be able to visualize this with the teleporting spot, is not necessarily that obvious. Okay. Multivariate trajectory analysis tool by Devin Lang. <laughs> this is now one of those like uh, top three or top four projects uh, that are like not ranked. I present the visualization tool for multivariate trajectory data. I will download example data set from the Carnegie Mellon NOPAT database. This includes the motion of people tracked with motion capture and stuff. You know, those dopey spandex ones covered with ping pong balls that any circus is always running around in. To get a sense of this particular motion, we can animate it. Here, each red dot is shown the motion of the ping pong ball. This particular animation shows a top-down view of a person running. The histograms give you a quick overview of the distribution of variables in the data set. In order to focus in on certain variables, you can remove ones that you don't care about. In addition to histograms, you can correlate different data points by graphing them together in scatter plots. This matrix lets you quickly select the combinations you are interested in. 
In this case, we can see the motion of the person is that they're staring directly at them in the first scatter plot. And in the second, we see a profile view of the motion. Since I have all the plots that I'm interested in, I can hide the selection widget to create space. Moving back to the history ends, I can select a range in the time history end to filter data on the other plots. Similarly, if I click and drag, you can start seeing that motion from multiple vantage points as I move that filtered time window. In this data set, the length attribute is the length of the bone that the ping pong ball is attached to. This can be leveraged to easily filter to different parts of the body, such as the feet. Animating the motion again, you can see the two feet are emphasized, and only the traces within our filter are visible. This is useful for detailed analysis of motion. In this case, you can observe the fact that as this person runs, they plant their feet near their center of mass, and while their feet are in motion, they swing outwards from their center of mass. Well, I've got to run. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
As snowfall, the surface of air increases, which drives further cooling as more energy is reflected back in space, which lowers temperatures and drives more snowfall. Likewise, as snow melts, the surface of air decreases, which drives further warming as more energy is absorbed, which raises temperatures and causes more snow to melt. This divergent effect creates a situation where dis distribution of surface temperature during winter widens to the point where the temperature anomaly becomes bimodal, which can be shown in the tab data views when tweaking the filters. Large bodies of water have a strong stabilizing effect on temperature. Temperature anomalies tend to be larger near the poles. Despite the poles having interesting variations in the temperature anomalies, measurements are harder to take. The sensors near Palmer's Peninsula is a good example of this, with year-round measurements ending in 1995. Okay. And then finally, <laughs> is I want to change over time by Max Martin and Jamie Adams. <laughs> Avalanche tool. Avalanche allows users to explore the characteristics of Utah's reported avalanches in a powerful and meaningful way. The data provided by the Utah Avalanche Center is comprised of avalanche reports submitted by the public and avalanche professionals alike. It does not capture all avalanches occurring across the state. Avalanche addresses this reporting bias by exploring the distribution of avalanches within a given characteristic, such as aspect. Different views reinforce the comparison between timeframes and against the total population of submitted reports. The new launch heat map allows users to specify the focus date range by brushing or clicking and dragging across the grid. The heat of individual cells represents the total number of observations for the month, and the calendar is shifted to be winter centric. Upon selection, the months of interest are scaled within the stack bar timeline to facilitate user interaction. To clear the selection, simply click anywhere in the grid. At the heart of the application is the stack bar timeline. Each multicolored stack bar represents one month in the distribution of avalanches within a selected characteristic. Hovering over the individual rectangles displays the percentage of avalanche reports within that characteristic. Within, while the total height of the stack bars represents one or 100% of, of all reported avalanches that month. Above the area chart, histogram, and supplemental density plot shows the total observations for each month. According to higher learning, makes the connection between the histogram and the stack bar timeline. In other words, so we can explain some of the terminology for each of the characteristic sets, as well as provide curated points of interest. These provide examples of what to look for in views, as well as interesting trends and talking points. Changing the selected characteristic also changes the story, text, as well as the points of interest. The radar chart in the center allows the user to explore the multivariate data all in one place. The gray path represents the distribution of all reported avalanches. The red path is overlaid and represents the current selection. The sum of each intercept, again, sums to 100% and represents the entire distribution for that set. Users can now easily compare the characteristics of the selection against the entire data set. Thanks for watching and enjoy. Okay. Great projects. Uh, generally, uh, we were pretty impressed by the quality of the project this year, so congratulations to everybody. We uh, really enjoyed uh, being able to watch all of these uh, videos and play with all those tools. Um, great. So uh, now let's move on. Um, recap. Um, I'll quickly go over what is the kind of stuff that we talked about, just to kind of like reflect a little bit of what we've actually studied in this class. So. Um, as you remember, I had the slide at the very beginning. Uh, essentially, this course is like a, like a, a mix between uh, theory, design skills, and coding skills. And um, I think that you kind of like noticed, like we kind of focused on coding skills in the beginning, at least in the lecture, and then over time, you got more like um, more uh, comfortable with using these three through homeworks and so on. And then in your projects, you could actually realize like these amazing projects by yourself without any guidance from us. So this was kind of like uh, the coding piece. And then we saw lots of really great design decisions when we looked at those projects. So like, um, I hope that these like uh, lectures on designing, lectures on like, design critiques and exercises uh, combined with the theory have kind of like, helped you build those kind of skills. Um, we, we spend a lot of time on exercises and design critiques. Right? So we had asked uh, questions like, what is a good visualization? 
Uh, and here are just some examples of, of stuff that we covered. Um, we also spent a fair amount of time on like actually developing basic programming skills like JavaScript, HTML, Five, and, and of course D3, uh, plus some other technologies. Um, so I hope this was also useful for you guys. In terms of theory, we started off with perception because this is kind of like the foundation of everything, right? So remember, like here are some uh, things like about like color blindness, right? Like it turns out that like 10% of all people are roughly colorblind or have at least a color weakness. We looked at pop-out effects and how we can use this in visualization, um, and then attention blindness um, and how that affects visualization. And other things like Gestalt principles and so on. Um, remember the uh, like barely noticeable, if you have a, like an interrupting stimuli, a barely noticeable engine here. Um, then we moved on to talk about data. Uh, and uh, from that to marks and channels, so what are the kinds of data types? We have tables, networks, fields, geometry, um, and we mostly cover tables and networks here. Um, and fields and geometry are something that you would cover in the visualization of scientific data course if you choose to take it next semester. Um, and then um, we talked about these, these marks and channels, and so this is kind of like the summary of this, right? Like we, like we really talked a lot about like what are the most, the most effective visual channels for each of these different uh, scenarios. Um, and these channels are derived from essentially study of, uh, of, of perception in psychology. So here we have Stephen's psychophysical power law, which shows us the perceived, intensi uh, perceived sensation versus the physical intensity of a stimuli. Um, and we kind of see from this chart that length is the only one that has a linear relationship. That's why we care so much about position and length. Um, we talked about design guidelines. How do I like? What do I have to think about when I design a visualization? Like, um, for example, like alternatives to pie charts, or like what is the, the the use of chart charm, or what not to do, right? So basically, the lesson, the main lesson that I like, wanted to convey here is that you that there isn't any kind of like set rules. Like there isn't. You can't say always do this and you will be right. You always have to be. Like honest about what's in your data, and and to choose to represent it as good as possible, um, with all of the necessary framing and context. Um, we talked about interaction from like the home finder application where we did a redesign with uh, like direct manipulation uh, to things like filtering, linking, and brushing, focus and context, and so on. Uh, and then we talked about multiple views, things like linked highlighting. Where we have, um, or, or like views where we have the same data but different views to show us different perspectives. Where we have views with different but complementary data. Where we have small multiples um, that kind of like show us different facets of a problem. And we talked a lot about partitioning, right? How can we divide up uh, a data set to reveal the effects that we care about? Um, so this is kind of like what we did before fall before fall break. And the next piece here is what we um, talk about after fall break, and this is of course now relevant to the upcoming exam. So we did talk about a table. So this is kind of like this plot where um, I like, have a couple of um, the tabular visualization techniques, and on the, on the far left we have techniques that basically don't need a lot of algorithmic support, things like parallel coordinates or scatterplot matrices. And then in the middle, where we really need to bring in some algorithmic support, for example, clustering for heat maps, um, like uh, Parallel sets doesn't really fit here, but on the far right um, we have multidimensional scaling, which is really just like scatter plots, um, and all the magic happens in the algorithms behind it. And then we talked about maps. The main lesson I want you to learn about maps was what? <laughs> you might not meet a map. <laughs> Um, and if like you, maybe there is something else that you can do that is actually more expressive, right? So maps are basically the problem with maps is that you give up position as your uh, as your visual um, variable. And maps are of course great if you really need this visual context, but for a lot of cases you don't need this visual context, right? Like everybody uh, in this room knows where roughly the states of the uh, United States are, and so you don't actually need to show that on a map. You can do things like that. Here, where this, this uh, swing states, how they have shifted over time, to essentially visualize much more uh, detailed data. Doing something like this on a map is problematic. But if you want to use a map, there's other rules to be learned about, right? Like the main key thing is that you you should not just like visualize population. Uh, that's kind of like a, a common mistake. So you need to do some things about that. Um, like for example, normalized population would be one simple solution. 
but you also have these like sparse areas, so you could maybe use something like um, proportional symbol map, symbols maps on top of it instead of core cut maps as I showed here. And then we talked a lot about projections um, and especially about the downsides of using the card for visualizing uh, the whole world at, at, at the same time. Uh, then we talked about networks, uh, both just like topology and multivariate networks. We had Carolina's guest lecture on multivariate networks. Just to recall, we distinguish between these three different types of networks, explicit networks that are node link diagrams where we do things like force directed layouts um, to essentially uh, create a visualization that is familiar to us and that kind of like optimizes the relationship between the nodes. Um, the matrix, in contrast, is kind of like very simple to like calculate positions and it shows you like edges in the cells by essentially filling in uh, an edge uh, filling in a cell wherever there is an edge between a row and the column. Um, and uh, those, of course, have different pros and cons. Remember that matrices are really bad at um, like path tasks. So if you want to find the connections from A to Z um, via a couple of hops, you will have a really hard time in a matrix. This might be quite easy if it's a small enough network in a node link diagram. Uh, but for example, you can easily find neighborhoods in a matrix. So you just look at this row and then like identify what are all the neighbors of that row. Um, you can also easily, easily visualize um, edge attributes on top of these networks. Um, you can easily visualize node attributes um, in, in a matrix. Um, and in uh, a node link diagram, you would have to do things like color coding the nodes and embedding charts. So there are some limitations on, on how far that can go. Um, implicit layouts are this special type of network layouts that only work for trees. And so implicit layouts, if you recall, this is all about um, uh, visualizing trees without actually visualizing the edges. Um, and so that's why it's called implicit. The edges are implicit in the diagram. And so we talked about tree maps, sunburst, and icicle plots. Um, like if you recall, this here is a, 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 an example of a tree map. Uh, like most tree map layouts do not show the backbone, but backbone of the tree. So they're very leaf centric. And they're also attribute centric, attribute, like leaf attribute centric. Whereas like a sunburst or an icicle plot shows both the structure um, and the leaves um, much better. Of course, there's workarounds in a, in, a, in a tree map, but they're not usually as effective. Um, then we talk about filtering and aggregation. Um, like filtering is about eliminating unnecessary items. Uh, aggregation is about grouping similar items. And then we talked about um, some algorithms for clustering. Like what are partitional algorithms that are those that create discrete pins? What are hierarchical algorithms that are those that create like a tree of similarity that they can then, after the fact, cut into discrete pins if you want to? And then we also like mentioned but didn't really explore in detail fuzzy clustering where you have probabilistic assignment to clusters. Um, we did talk a little bit about dimensionality reduction, like what is what are, what is the purpose of? We didn't talk about the, like how to actually calculate them. But how does it work intuitively? What are the problems with it? Um, and we talked about aggregation in space, things like Voronoi diagrams, um, and gerrymandering, and so on. Uh, yeah, and we talked about clustering algorithms. Um, we, the last lecture was all about uh, sets and text. So like text really, um, just recall, we had this like what the different purposes for text visualization, either like visualizing a single document, visualizing a text corpus, uh, doing something like creativity support, and also like visualizing for NLP for machine learning. These were kind of like the four areas. We really focused on the first two. We didn't actually talk much other than me giving a couple of pointer on, this, on the latter two. Um, and so like st text visualization is really like mostly about extracting structure from text. So it's actually more about like using NLP in a smart way um, and then like using this extracted information to visually encode it. Uh, when we talked about set visualizations, like the, the big, um, the big, this, uh, the big um, method that everybody thinks about are, of course, Venn and Euler diagram. Remember the distinction, Venn diagrams um, show every single possible intersection, even if it's empty. Uh, and Euler diagrams only show the non-empty intersections. So this here is the Venn diagram. There's actually no empty ones, but some very small ones. And this here is a Euler diagram. And then we talked about a couple of alternatives for visualizing sets, like line uh, sets, uh, like overlaying uh, bubble charts on top of a map, for example, and upset. OK, so that's kind of like the recap. Oh, uh, we can also talk about storytelling. Um, 
like this was kind of like we had these seven different genres that we um, the, of, of stories that we identified. Uh, we talked a little bit about like how does like a magazine story like this work? Like what is the, the main story? How can you reveal more depth about anything that you want to do? Um, and we then looked at interactive data stories where we had these kind of like first animated and first like narrated automatically and then you have a drill down opportunity to reveal more um, about the story that you, uh, if you care. Uh, we did talk about um, design methods and evaluation methods. This is kind of like admittedly like um, pretty short, uh, but we talked about things like parallel prototyping or Tamara Munzner's uh, like nested model for design and evaluation. Remember, this is the one paper that you really should read if you're in the 6638 version of this class, in the grad version of this class, because I'll be definitely asking a question about that um, for the grad students in here. Um, we talked about things like parallel prototyping, and then we also talked about evaluation strategies, right? Like, what are quantitative methods? What are qualitative methods? Um, what are kinds of like metrics that I can use to measure um, if I do quantitative methods um, and so on? Um, Okay, so I'm happy to take questions now about any of the content in this class if you want to like clarify something uh, for the exam or just have out of interest. Yeah. Uh, yes, to the like Tamara Manson's design study method, uh, not sorry, the nested model uh, for visualization design, uh, this one. Yes. So close book, same modality as before. I'm not going to ask any tricky questions. You need to learn these terms or anything like that. It's really concepts that I like to. Uh, okay. Um, I will see, like, maybe Jan can take a look at putting them into a playlist or something like that. Oh, all the videos? It is, it is, and it is, yeah. Okay. Uh, two quick questions. One simple one. The test is Thursday, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. During class time. Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Second one, would you describe the test as, like, more cumulative or mostly after? Life? Exclusively after uh, what, like, stuff that we didn't cover in the first exam. Is it still going to have like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript questions, or is it mainly going to focus on like the time? Um, it's mainly going to focus on like everything that we covered after, or it's gonna exclusively going to focus on everything that we didn't do before. We covered 95% of all the JavaScript and D3 stuff before. We had one advanced JavaScript lecture that is in the testing period. Um, so there might be a question on that. There was promises and this kind of stuff. But it's not, there's not going to be like a code question or fix it back or something like that. There's going to be again like the redesign, a redesign question. Yeah. Uh, about the same as the next last time. So um, six or seven, I haven't actually written it yet. You want help? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to put suggestions on Slack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else about the exam? Good. So um, I kind of wanted to point you a little bit. If this kind of stuff that we covered here, which is like probably not like core, like classical computer science, right? We didn't talk a lot about like runtime complexity or things and so on. But there's lots of others, uh, other other. Uh, classes and opportunities um, at uh, the University of Utah that are in that vein. So first, we have the visualization seminar, uh, which uh, runs every Wednesday at noon. Um, and it's open to everybody. They serve pizza. You can sign up if you need a seminar credit, but you can also just drop by. Usually, only one or two people a semester signed up. Everybody else just drops in out of interest. These are scheduled on the SKI website, uh, so you can actually see ahead of time what is going on. Uh, there's been a little bit of a bias towards uh, like scientific visualization in the last year or so, uh, but that's not generally the policy here. 
Um, then there is an advanced data visualization course, which is taught, taught by Bing Wang. Uh, it's uh, 6956. Um, so she covers like some topological methods. She also covers large uh, networks, but she also moves stuff around. So like, I'm not completely sure what she'll cover next time she does this. Um, and then there's, of course, like a course like this. Um, this for scientific data. This is kind of like at the same level. Those two courses are actually like you don't have to take one to take the other. Uh, but like this one here is about visualizing volumetric data, scientific data, MRI, geometry, and so on. Um, it's not gonna like the technology that they use is BTK, so there's C++ programming. Um, it's not web-based. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in that, this is definitely something. If, if you enjoy visualization, that that's a course to take. Um, and you know, like if you really got excited about this and are, for example, in, like want to do the project option for your master's, um, you can also do an independent study with either me or Mariah Meyer or any other of this faculty. Um, by essentially like being in that course, you really know like what are the kinds of things that we care about. Um, so you would be a good candidate. So if you want to learn like about that, just like, shoot me an email. Look at our website to see the kinds of projects that we usually do. Um, and then um, like. Visualization, like I think of like visualization traditionally is, is kind of like thought of as part of graphics, but I personally think of it as like more closer to either data or HCI, probably like right between uh, and all of like data science and HCI. Um, and so visualization is also an important part in our human centered computing track. Um, that's kind of like a new MS um, PhD track um, where we like have four classes that are HCI, advanced HCI, this class. And then introduction to statistics and research design, um, and then there's like many other classes um, that are even, like even outside of the department. Things like um, uh, introduction to research design and ed education psychology, ethnographic methods in anthropology, product design and development in the school of design, and so on. So this is a track where you have like if you're interested in this kind of like HCI work, there's lots of opportunities here to get the degree in HCI or in human centered computing by still exploring lots of different classes in space across campus. Um, great, so now I would like to get some feedback. Of course, like I want to point you to the, uh, to the uh, evaluation. I have like a QR code about that later, but I want to first kind of like talk a little bit more informally um, and really like focus on like what can we do to make this course better for the next year's students. Um, so like the questions like, where are your expectations met? What else would you like to learn about? Did you feel prepared? Uh, for requisites appropriate? Was it too much work? <laughs> was it too easy? Uh, too little programming? Too much programming? Did you like the whole web stack, JS, T3? Did you enjoy the project? And so on. <laughs> so I really love to hear from you. Yeah. I thought that the amount of programming for the course was not appropriate. I thought like it was reasonably paced, so I like scheduled things around it, but it didn't feel overwhelming. Okay. Does everybody agree with that? I see some nodding and some shaking heads. Um, I I also really like the programming, and I thought it was a fantastic course. Um, where I got frustrated. So it's um, in how, how deep JavaScript can be with bigger data. Um, and so I, I found myself frustrated trying to run a higher cluster on just 2,000 points. Um, so yeah, I would kind of like to have a little bit of uh, experience with a little bit of back end. Um, how can I incorporate it? Yeah, that's a very good comment. I, I struggle with this question right? because we, like, Every single project we run in our group needs a backend. They basically, it never is just pure frontend. But in the end, if we do that, we introduce another programming language, unless we do Node, and we introduce like these other libraries, and we introduce so much complexity uh, that I'm just not sure whether this is like manageable in a course that's not about web design, right? If this were a web design course, I would of course cover this stuff. But we really do web design as like the tools we need uh, for building visualizations. And so um, I would love to teach, like, and I might teach in the future, like an advanced web design course where we really go into these kind of things. But I like, I don't think that we will have time in this course to fit it in. Um, I guess like it's, it's, it's super important feedback, but I, I just don't see how like we could that, do that. 
Jeremy's just like going off of that. Jeremy's specific recommendation for like online resources or something that can help like us gain that knowledge. Uh, I don't have something that I can easily point you to. Um, I, there is like basically like the stuff we use are like we usually do like Python uh, language wise and Flask as a lightweight server and some databases depending on what we need. Either SQL, NoSQL, or Graph, uh, and then usually something with machine learning, um, like Scikit-Learn. Uh, but they're, they're, they have a little bit like I teach a class like this in like for for non-CS students. That's called Introduction to Data Science. Uh, there we cover some of the Python stuff and some of the like uh, Scikit-Learn things, but we don't cover web servers. There is an undergraduate course here at the U that teaches uh, web development, but there isn't really a grad course that does any of that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm probably biased because I have never used JavaScript for this course and because I like to draw. But I would have preferred, instead of so much programming, some assignments that were just uh, designing stuff, mm -hmm. like making really low fidelity apps and things and graded like on was that a smart condition or not. Because I feel like the only opportunity we really got to do that for was the project. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get that much time to do the designing part of the project. We just had to get right into coding right away, so it's finished. And um, and then the in class exercises here for fun, but you know never never got beyond like a little doodle. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, that's actually something that we dropped this year. Uh, we, like, unfortunately, like, not <laughs> consciously. Uh, we, but we also didn't have much of it. But I'm definitely gonna like do, do something like that. We had homework six. We had a component where uh, people had to completely design their own view, like submit three different designs and implement one of them. Uh, we kind of like didn't do this this year because we were struggling that we were afraid that the complexity of homework six was too high already and if we gave people another um, piece to, to, to that that would have been problematic but I definitely hear that and it's actually something that I value a lot so um, maybe what we'll do is we'll like we get rid of one of the coding exercises completely and do like a sheer design uh, exercise that, that's probably a good idea I agree with that so like what you were saying, I think like some of the five examples that we got and then like that year I think was one that just focuses on redesigning or piece of the nine and some of the other like things and then assign the fifth would be like that thing and then some of Yeah, I like that idea. And then like for this final that's going to be mostly based off of like the concepts of visualization and theory, I think it would have been nice to have like a design and design of that helps us practice those concepts before we go to Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I definitely agree with that assessment. Yeah. I feel like if you wanted to focus on something else, for example, like homework one was kind of not as important as the other ones, building stuff, it's just kind of tedious having to like show this SVG stuff by hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did everybody feel like that? <laughs> so no SVG? <laughs> yeah, that was the point, right? It makes you appreciate to some degree, yeah. yeah um, I mean, for me, yeah, it, was, it was easy and it was tedious, but that week was a, a good week for me to like get caught up on the basics of JavaScript without having any like, background in that. So um, kind of a buffer week. Who came in into this class without JavaScript or experience? Okay, yeah, it's like half probably. <laughs> so like, what's the learning curve? Okay. I don't know if this is specific to the learning curve or what, but the most frustrating thing for me working on the programming assignments was trying to understand the architecture that was already pre-built for me. Uh, especially because I was also trying to get up to speed on CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. And so I, I struggled to see where I was supposed to be pulling from and pushing into to fit the architecture that was already there. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if there's a great place so, for that. But. Yeah, I think that there's two options, right? We could either be much more explicit about how things are connected in some kind of like source code to do's, um, or we could not enforce a structure like that. Um, I'm not sure whether like both. This is kind of tricky, right? Like it, ideally, what we would love to do is like you to review the stuff. Uh, after we try to build it, review our solutions to kind of understand what we were trying to do. 
Uh, but I don't know how to integrate that. Do you have an opinion which of those two options that I laid out would be more useful? Um, I think throwing away the architecture would be better in a way, especially since, well, I mean, for a grad program, at least people are coming from all sorts of backgrounds, so there's no guarantee that someone's going to build a nice architecture. But um, I think having basic, a basic structure for the data and a defined data set is enough to be able to build your own architecture. Personal. Um, or, or on that note, um, having a brief walkthrough about like how did you build that? Like how did you get there from the beginning? Because um, it was just kind of presented, and, and there were steps in the actual spec for the assignment. It was like this, this does this, this does this. So it wasn't super hard to navigate if you're willing to read the spec ten times. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the process of like how did you get there from from the data? Yeah. I concur with that statement as well because, like, while it was really difficult to figure out the architecture from scratch, uh, at least for our final project, we used a lot of the principles from the architecture that was in previous assignments, like the overarching callback structure. Like, that helped us because we knew we had exposure to that architecture. So I guess, like, some degree of like letting us know what what kind of architecture you're aiming for, what the thought behind that like, might be useful. Okay. Yeah. We can definitely emphasize that more. And I would say, like, I did find the, uh, like, it took much less time to read the documentation or, like, what, to understand the existing framework than to make it from scratch, not having any knowledge of how to do that. So, still keeping it, but having a bit more depth in your okay. tutorials, I guess. Yeah, I'd also concur with that. Just a little bit more contextual of, you know, a high level. Before you get into this, we're going to go here, and here's the architecture best practice we're using. We're going to do this, because a lot of times you found, you're in the exam, you know, you're in the code and you're like, now you're gonna fill this part out, but you got steps two and five and three and one. So it's like, where am I? Yeah. So just a little bit more contextual of here's how we're gonna approach it, we're gonna jump here, 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 and this is why. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I I know some of the assignments were built specifically for this semester, um, but there were like some contradictions between the way that the code actually worked and the what was in the data sheet or whatever. Um, okay. Not a lot of time, but let's do that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's, yeah, if you, like, if you spot something like this, just let us know, right? There is some, like, this is a complicated process, building a project like this. Like, basically, when you prepare homework, it's like running a project for you guys for a final project. And so uh, there is definitely, like, potential of us screwing up something. Uh, but if you spot something like that, just let us know, and we, we definitely want to fix that. <laughs> Uh, I really love the TA labs that went on my collection. I yeah. thought those were super helpful. So. Good. Uh, so I don't know if this would make sense given the distribution of people have no JavaScript experience, but uh, I personally like TypeScript <laughs> orders of magnitude better than JavaScript. Uh, we, we exclusively use TypeScript in our work. Uh, Problem is that you need to know JavaScript um, anyways, I think. Um, so I don't know whether we want to do that. Uh, I, I didn't know JavaScript and for our project. My partner chose the TypeScript. And I was kind of afraid at first that TypeScript definitely helped catch errors a lot better than JavaScript. So I actually think it's easier than JavaScript. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, that's why I agree. <laughs> but you still have to know JavaScript, right? So like, is that, can you teach just TypeScript and not JavaScript? <laughs> I mean, it's basically just JavaScript, except you explicitly type Yeah, I don't know. At least now, like not three years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I guess uh, to, to add on to that, I don't know anything about TypeScript, but I felt like learning JavaScript is such a huge burden on this course where I wanted to focus on like, the other materials, um, even in terms of lecture time and how that happens. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, this is a tricky compromise, right? If you don't, if you don't teach it, it we, we we are not able to build stuff for ourselves, right? Um, I know that, for example, that um, many ATI courses here uh, don't ask you to build anything, right? Uh, they they really are focused completely on the design. Uh, I personally like. It feels a little frustrating to me um, if I um, if I can like show all of those cool visualization techniques, but don't give you the part to actually build them. Uh, so, 
it's kind of a compromise, but I definitely see the point that you could emphasize design a little more. Yeah, that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to take this class. I mean, besides the fact that it's a I also wanted to learn JavaScript. And so yeah. I thought that was really important. Yeah. But I have seen some undergraduate courses have um, sort of ramp up assignments that are pre the semester. That could help people get up to speed on JavaScript or HTML and CSS. I don't know. Yeah, I think those are in an undergrad curriculum. You have a little bit more, like, you can plan a little better what people have taken already. Like some math, some of you might be here for the first semester and have no CS degree, so all of this is a little bit problematic. That, that said, those kind of ramp up assignments that are three semesters can help students decide whether this is the course they want to take this semester or if they need to take a theoretical exam this semester. Yeah. Great. Um, I have one quick specific question. Um, project, is that kind of like, uh, too much emphasis on the project, too little? What did you think about the milestone? Um, well, the project, I would actually prefer more project and no tests. Yeah. But I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, for hard assignments, a project. And, and also, one recommendation if you're going to create grad students different than undergrads, maybe emphasize the project more on grad students. Um, <laughs> Did you change the syllabus, like the syllabus, the grading syllabus halfway through the course? No. I got an email saying it changed and the percentages need to change. I did the bonus at the bonus. Um, that's probably the email you got. Okay. No, I saw that one. I didn't change that. Okay. I'm mistaken. I don't think, like, I definitely didn't. And if I did, it was just a correction to something that was a mistake. So I didn't yeah. change the so right. I feel like the project Yeah, I, I hated the Thanksgiving piece. Uh, that was kind of unpleasant, and I originally like had this due on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, right? But then we did a voting class, um, and then I moved to the office to Thanksgiving because it was like forty-eight to two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, generally, I guess yeah. A similar question is Friday deadlines good, or would you prefer Sunday deadlines? Who would prefer Sunday deadlines? Who would prefer Friday deadlines? <laughs> okay, so roughly even. Um, so, um, regarding the project, I like the project. I want to have learned more of the theory from the project. I did. It would have been good. Because at the milestone, it was basically I have like a basic structure of what I think is going to be there, and then um, it didn't feel like we were talking about. Theoretically, these things would make more sense, which these things would uh, make it a better visualization. It was just like, where do we go from here? We move forward. Um, so I, I think it would have been yeah. nice to have like one more like feedback session. Like, yeah, feedback session where it was specifically focused on like, yeah. how you perceive this as a theoretical yeah. like, advancement. Okay, um, I think that is a good uh, piece uh, for like future. Like you can always go to office hours, right? If you want that. Like some people did come to my office hours regularly, and then of course we talk only about the design. So I don't know how much you should, this class changes between semesters, but this is kind of in general something that bugs me is when there's assignments that are like the same every semester, but they, they only get released like one week in advance. It'd be kind of cool if just all the assignments were there for like a whole semester. And obviously, you teach the material as you get towards the deadline, but like. Like some of them, I feel like I could have done like one assignment ahead and then had the time for other classes. Yeah, we, we never reuse everything, right? Like we like we always change the assignments, every single one. Uh, so that's tricky to do for us. Um, we also don't want like the reason why we don't want to keep them the same is just because people keep and uh, have them, right? Um, and <laughs> and then we get into these uncomfortable situations where I have to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with students. Um, 
And yeah, so but I, I hear that um, it's it's I would love to do it. Uh, it's just hard with the resources we have, right? If I had five TAs, um, that would be easier. Um, but I, yeah, we try to be as proactive about that as we can. Yeah. I'm just going back to Nelson. I want to say that, like, at least for me, I was seeing like the reviews, like, it was extremely helpful. Because, like, one, and that we actually had to, like, make progress early. <coughs> and also, then, it, like, helped us gauge, like, what is enough, what is not enough. And, like, like the feedback we got was really helpful. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. Great. Um, what did you think about the design critiques and the redesigns in class? Should I have spent more time on this, or was it too much? Okay. I had a sense that it's a little, um, sometimes a little rushed. This year, I just got like a little bit behind with content, and sometimes I cut five minutes off of an exercise, which I shouldn't have, maybe. Uh, uh, but yeah. Okay. Great, so if you have any other comments, shoot me an email. If you want to put something anonymous, um, just put it in the, in the official evaluation. Here's the, the, the link. Um, you will also get to this to CIS. Um, please do take five minutes to evaluate this course. Um, we really care about the evaluations are important for us to improve our teaching, but they are also important for us because we, this is kind of like showing people externally that we put an effort uh, into teaching this uh, course. So I'll leave this up for uh, for a second, if you want to like photograph the QR code. Um, in the meantime, um, I also wanted to say thanks. This has been like I've taught this class now five times at Utah, um, and you guys have been the most engaged audience so far. So it was a lot of fun that I had so many people that really participated in class and really enjoyed that. Um, so it was a great semester for me. Um, I love teaching this stuff. Um, and I want to thank the TAs, Jen, Kieran, and Elkin. Um, they did a lot of amazing jobs, so let's give them a hand. Yeah, thanks you for participating, and then oh, good luck with the exam on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I heard that great thing.